Welcome, welcome to this talk on green software engineering. Um, and thank you. Yes, my name is Asim Hussain. I'm the executive director and chairperson of the Green Software Foundation, which I'll talk a little bit about later on. I'm also the Green Cloud Advocacy Lead at Microsoft. So my life is really all about looking at sustainability through the lens of software, which is, believe it or not, a lens that not many people in this world uh, uh, look through when, when we're tackling the challenge of sustainability. So what is green software engineering? Well, it's an emerging discipline at the intersection of climate science, software practices and architecture, electricity markets, hardware and data center design. Basically, to be a green software engineer, you actually have to know about a whole bunch of other things that you're just not taught normally in, well, the normal ways and places that you learn about software engineering. You need to know what electricity is. You need to know how electricity is bought and sold. You need to know how hardware is uses electricity to execute your software. You need to know what data centers are, how they're built, how do they function. Um, these are things that you need to understand in order to build greener applications. And when we're talking about greener applications, we're very much focused on carbon emissions. We Green software engineering is the discipline of building software which emits less carbon into our atmosphere. We are hyper-focused on reduction. So our focus is applications that reduce the physical carbon molecules that are going into our atmosphere. Our focus is not neutralization. You cannot be, be a green application solely by doing nothing and buying some offsets. And by offsets, I, I we count not only what you might consider offsets, like planting trees, and these are all, we need offsets. Offsets are very, very important. And I'll go into why we don't focus in on on, 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 on neutralization in, in green software engineering. But we, we, we don't include um, uh, offsets for things like trees, but we also don't include kind of renewable energy credits and other kind of energy-based, electricity-based based kind of offset uh, uh, products. Um, and we'll go into details why. Um, and it's also new and evolving. Everything I'm about to talk to you today, it's very exciting that it's new and evolving, but the challenge of being new and evolving is that everything I'm about to teach you today might actually be out of date in six months' time. Um, a lot of it probably won't be, but some of it might be. So just be, 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 be aware of that. And it's actually a wonderful opportunity rather than a problem. So there's several kind of components, and as I said, everything's evolving. There's several kind of components to kind of green software engineering kind of right now. There's two philosophies which I'll go through. Um, this is kind of the, the culture of the of the of the discipline. There's something that we that we've had for a long time called the eight principles of green software engineering. Not a long time, a year. The eight principles of green software engineering, and it's still very 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 useful. So head to there, and we will be covering some of the things that we mentioned in principles green. But with some of our, some of our latest thinking, it is due for kind of an evolution, uh, maybe kind of into something that we're now calling kind of the taxonomy of actions, um, which I will go through. I will go through taxonomy of actions. Another component to kind of green software engineering, engineering is standards of measurement, and that's something that we're focusing on in the Green Software Foundation with what's called what we call the Software Carbon Intensity Standard, and I'll kind of go through that in in some level of detail here. Um, another things that we need to focus in on is kind of is best practices and patterns of software development. You know, how do you actually build applications that emit less carbon? I'm not going to go into that today. That's, that's an incredibly big topic, and again, it's something that we're looking to create in the in the foundation. And the developer tooling, again, developer tooling is, is something developers need in order to build greener applications. And that's, again, something that we're, we're trying to work on inside the, the foundation as well. Um, so let me just cover the two philosophies because I'd like to get this out of the way to begin with. Um, and there's a great report that I refer to quite often. Um, it's 10 years old now. It's from the, an advertising agency called Ogilvy, um, called Mainstream Green, where they basically analyze the whole audience for essentially products and services. And they said, well, th that audience is, is made up of like 16% of people who identify as super green. These are people who are fully kind of cognizant and aware of what's going on with our environment and are just willing to do something about it. And the green rejectors are what you might guess green rejectors are, kind of people who don't believe in climate change and or actively work against it. Um, so they are, they are kind of the bottom 18%. Um, if anything, I would argue from 10 years today, that's probably become a lot more polarized. There's probably a lot more green rejectors and a lot more super greens. Um, and and one of the and one of the things that 
you know, the, the, it's almost the, the, the strange attitude that we've had in kind of the sustainability space for the longest time is like, oh, let's just get all the... So so when you think about the, the whole software development industry, 16% of everybody cares about this. They care about this stuff. But we've never really given anybody things to do. We've always said, okay, that's great. You care about this. Why don't you go on a march? But the thing... But people are sitting at their jobs eight hours a day. What can they do? What can they do to be part of the solution. They are yearning for this information and it's what we fail to provide because quite often in the past, what we would focus in on is kind of the, the five people in an organization that can pull the biggest lever, okay? Uh, maybe those are the five people that have influence over which data center that you use. I mean, the, most, the average engineer that works inside an organization does not have that level of influence. And so in the past, we've only really focused the conversation on a couple of small people and, and, and the impact has been very, very low because those five people who have that kind of influence are not acting alone. They are going to be listening to the thousands and thousands of other people inside their organization, if you are working in an organization that big, before they make those kinds of decisions. So what we have in the green software engineering is everybody has a part to play, whatever discipline you're in, wherever sector, Whatever role you play, it, you, you doesn't need, you don't need to. We not even we try not to even use the word engineer to be honest with you, because there's so many people involved in the business of building software. Um, every single one of them has something um, to do, and that's what we aim to provide people with kind of green software engineering. Whether you're in front end machine learning databases, whether you're a, an IT decision maker, or whether you are somebody just starting off in your career. There is something for you to do. That's what green software engineering is here. We are creating a, a, a movement for everybody, not just for the few. Um, the other kind of philosophical aspect is, is that sustainability is enough all by itself to justify our work. There are, if you look at a green application, a green application is almost always cheaper. It's almost always faster. It's almost always more resilient. It's like better on almost all characteristics than kind of a its gray counterpart of software. Um, but oftentimes, so oftentimes what we may end up doing is arguing for sustainable, for, to, to, to build more sustainable applications just on those merits. So we'll never actually use the word sustainability. We'll never use the word green. We'll just always say like, look, this is cheaper. We should do it. This is cheaper. We should do the cheaper way. Oh, look, this is faster. Let's just do the faster way. Um, and I agree, like you win the war. When you make those kinds of arguments, you win the war. You win the battle, I should say, but you lose the war. Because what we need to do is to bring sustainability as a, a, a just a, a normal everyday topic that, that is discussed in every single technical meeting. We discuss um, security, we discuss performance, we discuss cost, we discuss uh, the risk of bugs, we discuss all, all of these things in every single day when we're discussing um, uh, technical issues in our software. We never discuss sustainability. But our goal is to bring sustainability into that conversation so that it is discussed in on balance with everything else that, that's going on in, 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 in the business of creating software. So there are two philosophies of green software engineering. I like to kind of set set the tone with that so that um so that frankly it does become the philosophies of the space. Um so yeah, so the principles.green is something that we did um uh, a while ago, I still recommend heading to it, principles.green, it's all there, and you'll find out a whole bunch of information, um, and it was kind of designed to be a quick 30 minutes to level set everybody, to get everybody to kind of the, the same level of understanding of, of, of even the terminology and some of the issues, so it's got eight principles of green software engineering, and I thought it's still very, very important for you to, to, to head to there, it's a lot of very useful information, none of that's going to go away, it's just we might categorize it um, differently to them than eight principles moving forward. Um, and that's kind of what this is moving into. So now what we talk about a lot more is what we call the taxonomy of actions. Um, and so that essentially our aim is to kind of green software. And again, this is changed to software. So the software emits less carbon that gets broadly broken down into kind of two sub types of actions. And one is what we call carbon efficient, which is changes to the code or architecture of an application so it's responsible for emitting less carbon. So it uses some resource linked to carbon more efficiently. Um, and there's two 
kind of common kind of methods of that one is to make an application energy efficient um, and i'll go into kind of energy efficiency in a second why that's important but essentially using less electricity to do the same job and the other one is hardware efficient which is essentially use less hardware to do the same job and i'll, and I'll go into details about more about this in the next couple of slides and the third one is, is, is really interesting. So it's called carbon awareness, which is changes the behavior of an application so it's responsible for emitting less carbon. Oftentimes, it's kind of the, the tagline for this is kind of doing more when there are more renewables and doing less when there are less renewables available right now. Um, electricity, the kind of renewable electricity available right now. But I'll, I'll go more into the, each, each of those uh, actually, well, actually now. So energy efficiency. So Energy is the single biggest emitter of carbon dioxide. It accounts for about 25% of, of global emissions. Um, um, and that's because most electricity is still actually created through the burning of fossil fuels, mostly actually coal right now. So for whatever our achievements are, are, are so far, uh, we're still making most of electricity through fossil fuels, through burning, through burning things. Um, and therefore, we call we call these things we call certain things kind of carbon proxies, which are, you know, they're, they're so tightly linked to carbon, you might as well treat them as carbon. So electricity is what we call a proxy for carbon. So basically, using we just know that almost almost in almost all cases, it's going to be true that using using less electricity is going to re re result in less carbon being emitted into our atmosphere. So. That's why kind of energy and doing anything to make your application more energy efficient is a good thing to do uh, or is a greening activity for your for your software. Um, now, the unit for this is 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 kilowatt hour. So. Um, so a watt is a rate. So a watt means one joule per second. A kilowatt is therefore 1000 joules per second. And a kilowatt hour is a volume of electricity. It's like what if you were to leave that tap running for an hour? What is the volume of electricity you would get at the end of that? Um, so that's kind of an, this is why it's important to know about electricity because I actually didn't know that before I started this whole journey. Um, hardware efficiency. So that was electricity, but everything emits carbon in its creation or destruction. I was going to hold up my mobile phone. Now let's imagine this is my mobile phone. Um, uh, Everything, including mobile phones, laptops, everything. Everything emitted carbon when it was created and will emit carbon when it's destroyed. Um, and, and so therefore, like hardware is a proxy for carbon. And using less hardware means emitting less carbon. The, the, the concept is in, in hardware is, 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 is what we call embodied carbon, uh, which is the carbon embodied in a, in a, in a, in a, in a physical thing. Um, and so to be hardware efficient, so how do you, so how do you actually be, be hardware efficient? Well, it depends. Um, typically, if you're in the cloud, it just means using fewer machines to do the same job. Um, and the dirty secret, most servers are actually idle. Like if you look at the, 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 the global average on-premise, not hyper cloud like Microsoft and Google and Amazon, but typical on-premise everyday servers, everyday data, data centers, it's about 10% utilization, one zero. Um, most servers are idle. So it's a, it's a huge opportunity in the cloud for just using less servers, you know, running more things on one server. Um, but if you've got a mobile phone, imagine it's a mobile phone, like you can't use less of a mobile phone. So kind of how does, how does hardware efficiently, efficiency relate to, um, to mobile phones? Oh, I think I actually have, um, some slides I forgot. Yeah. So using fewer machines to do the same job. Now, the first place people normally go when they think of green software engineering is, is code efficiency. Um, like, let's just make my code super efficient. But when we look in the cloud, we're not, that's making this assumption that all servers being run at 100%. If you made your code more efficient, you would use less servers. And that's not true. Most servers are running a kind of low utilizations um, from, an, from a kind of on-premise perspective. Um, and so like making your code more efficient, I mean, that may be, maybe, maybe all that happens is that actually most servers are then 5% utilized. Um, so from, from, from looking, so looking at things from a, a code efficiency perspective is, is, is the wrong angle. Um, it, it is important in, 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 in 
it, it definitely in, in use cases, but it's important in the UK, in kind of the single device use case. Um, the big challenge in kind of the cloud is is basically running more on the on increasing the server utilization, increasing the average server utilization of your of everything that you're using is the best thing you can do. You should pin it to one hundred percent. Um, if you tr if you should be making sure that every single server you're using in the cloud is running at 100%. And this, I've seen studies like when you run servers at 100%, they're more likely to fail. But it doesn't matter. The the benefits of running at 100% far outweigh the disadvantages of more servers failing. Um, so just keep, pin it to 100%. So using fewer machines to do the same job, and that's a software problem, not a um, not a hardware problem. You can make hardware as efficient as possible. If, if it's just being used 10%, what's the point? Um, and the other one from a device's perspective, just to make hardware last longer, like most devices that we have don't break. My mobile phone will not, probably not break before I stop using it. What will probably happen is that it just becomes unusable. Um, the applications and the things I need to run on it just won't work on it anymore. Um, I had to uh, get rid of an old iPhone that I, I gave to my mother a long time ago just because Skype stopped working on it. Um, it was a very, very old iPhone, I admit, but um, it was perfectly capable of, of running things. Um, and that's, that's the reality. Most hardware doesn't break. It just reaches an end of life um, and is decommissioned by either by you, your personally, or by an organization from a server perspective. So make hardware last longer. So what you, how you normally do it is, is you you get kind of let's imagine a server was 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 four tons. That's a that's a crazy server. It's four tons of carbon. But anyway, it was four tons of carbon. Um, the and we amortize that over four years. So um, uh, we take uh, 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 the four tons of carbon and we say, well, it's it's, it's about one ton each year. And maybe that's kind of 80 kilograms a, a month, which is maybe like 2.2 kilograms a day. You kind of amortize it over the year. But really, why why four years? You just We just kind of made an assumption that something's going to be end of life after four years. And it's going to be end of life because the software won't run on it anymore. You know, so what if we could amortize it over five years? What if we made software so that you didn't have to throw away things um, as quickly. And oftentimes that means making it more efficient. So being hardware efficient from a device's perspective is just making it run efficiently, not trying to push the limits of the latest hardware that's coming along. Make it work, make it okay, make it okay to work on older hardware, on older devices. And very efficient software does kind of work on much, much older hardware. Um, that's kind of the nature of it. So, so that's kind of why being, being hardware efficient is quite important. And carbon awareness. So electricity uh, essentially varies in how clean or dirty it is. So, um, um, and what we call, we call this the carbon intensity of electricity. Now the units is grams of carbon per kilowatt hour. And I mentioned before kind of carbon, kilowatt hour is a, is a volume of electricity. So grams of carbon is the literal kind of grams of carbon that are emitted per kilowatt hour that's generated. The global average in 2019, I've done the global average for, 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 for years since, I just memorized the global average in 2019, was 519 grams of carbon per kilowatt hour. So that's about um, half, a, half, a, half, a, half a kilo. And the way to imagine that is just imagine half a kilo of, of kind of soot ash in your hands. Um, and uh, 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 I'm sorry, I'm getting pinged by um, by by Slack. I forgot to switch it off. But anyway, it doesn't matter. If I get distracted, that's what's going on. Uh, hopefully you can't hear the, the Slack things. Um, and yes, 519 grams. So, so this, that, that's kind of uh, uh, the global average of, of electricity. But the thing is, it varies. It varies depending on how much uh, renewable or clean energy resources your region happens to have. So a great resource for this is, is what time. Um, they're actually a member of the, of, the, of the Green Software Foundation as well. And what they provide is that they can essentially calculate this. They calculate what the how clean or dirty electricity is in, in various grids and, and regions around the world. So here you can see the kind of the darker red is, is the dirtier electricity and the, the, the greener it is, 
is the cleaner the electricity. So these regions tend to have more renewable sources of electricity. Um, the darker red ones tend to have more electricity created by burning things, by burning coal and, and things like that. So just depending on the on the, the amount of renewable versus uh, uh, a non-renewable, uh, so low carbon versus high carbon source of electricity in a region, the carbon intensity varies. So then you may be thinking, well, actually, then I can just kind of run things in different regions. Yes, you could. Um, but it also varies by time. It varies by time in kind of a very interesting way. So one surprising factor about electricity grids that I, I found out is that there's actually very little storage. Almost no storage. Storage is extremely expensive. Batteries are extremely expensive. Natural batteries, which is kind of pumping water into fjord, they're, they're much, much more efficient. But if you don't have the geography to support that, you don't really have a lot of battery storage. Um, in, in, a, in, a, in, any, in any Nobody really has much battery storage at all. So what that means is that utility providers have to make sure that the exact amount of demand for electricity um, that they, they supply exactly the amount of electricity every single minute that they're supplying exactly the amount of electricity that people need. And if they don't supply enough electricity, that's when brownouts happen. Okay. And so their stress and pressure is that they have to kind of predict what everybody's using every single hour of the day. And they need to make sure that enough electricity is being generated by the people they're buying electricity from or they're, 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 they're making to supply all of that stuff. Now, in a world where you just burn stuff, that's easy because you're just like, well, look, we need a bit more now. Can you might, can you burn a bit more coal? Is that right? Okay, fine. Excellent. In a world of renewables, it's a bit different because we don't control the wind and the sun. Um, if the wind stops blowing or the sun stops shining, then the um, something else needs to happen. What typically needs to happen is that more coal or gas is burnt. And what this means is that over time the carbon intensity of electricity changes over the course of a day. It might be 120 grams uh, per kilowatt hour at this point because there's lots of wind and solar. The wind dies down, the sun dies down, more coal and gas is burnt to meet the same demand and therefore the, the carbon intensity increases. So it varies by time and you can again go to what time and you can see you know, in diff different grids the carbon in emissions intensity over time. So it kind of va can vary by, by, by quite large amounts. Um, and in fact, the, the really interesting aspect about, about what's called marginal carbon intensity, which is what you want to really look at, is it sometimes dips to zero. Um, that's because of the, the you, can, you can have scenarios where there is so much wind being generated that they have to throw it away. There's more wind is being generated than um, is the demand. Uh, there's no battery storage, so we throw it away. So essentially... For the time you're throwing away really good renewable electricity, if you're to lose, use electricity at that moment, you're essentially using electricity with zero grams because it's coming from that, that renewable energy that was about to get thrown away. So that's kind of this really interesting idea um, of, of kind of carbon intensity, carbon awareness. And what carbon awareness is all about is about, well, can you then run your process and jobs so it just understands this carbon intensity of electricity and takes advantage of it either runs in regions which are greener runs at times that are greener or if you can optimize and run at times where it's dipped to zero perfect then you've got the the the, the most guilt free guilt free use of electricity that's possible um so there's various carbon intensity sources uh, the free one from the uk is carbon intensity.org.uk um again what time is a great resource um they're a non-profit based in the, in the united states and Electricity Map is a more is a European based startup and um, they've got data for well they both both of those organizations have data for all over the world, but um uh, we tend to use both of them. So again, coming back to the kind of taxonomy of actions. So that's kind of what the three actions that you can take is one, make your applications more energy efficient because electricity uh, emitted carbon when it was created. Second, make your applications more hardware efficient, use less hardware to do the same job um, and that's because most hardware has embodied carbon and um, it creates carbon in its creation and will create carbon in its destruction and the third one being carbon aware change the behavior of an application 
So it does more when there's more renewables available, i.e. when the carbon intensity of the electricity is low, and does less when there's less renewables available, i.e. your carbon intensity of electricity is higher. Um, but the challenge is, here's the challenge, here's the challenge. There's actually very little incentivization in software teams to, to, to focus in on these three areas. There's very little incentivization to focus on those three areas. Um, and and the, the two reasons are, are this. One, neutralization. It's far cheaper and less risky to buy an offset than pay developer. We are paid way too much, way too much. One solution to this whole problem is pay developers 10% of what we're paid. I mean, then, then, it'd, be, then it'd be cheaper to have a team of developers make software more efficient um, than buy an offset. But essentially, that's 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 really what it, what it boils down to. Is, it, is it's oftentimes it's just easier to when the, when when offsets are available, it's easier to, to just keep everything the same and buy an offset than it is to just reduce. Um, when you look at kind of the Science Based Targets um, Institute kind of um, a definition of net zero. And some organizations have this def have follow this definition and some organizations don't, which is net zero means first reducing your emissions. And only once you can't reduce any more, do you then offset? Um, I think, unfortunately, a lot of people, when they just think of net zero, they just think of, oh, just buy offsets to net it off. Oh, awesome. We're amazing. No, it's, it's about the reduction. And the challenge is when you, when you give the opportunity for neutralization, it, 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 reduces the bias towards action for reduction because they just you have this just simple solution of just buying an offset buying your way out of it whereas reduction is is, is a lot more effort um and it, it frankly requires code changes which are always risky and um and uh and yeah so the other problem is is, is measurement so how we measure it takes where you put effort in um if the method of measurement that you have inside your organization uh, for your software doesn't bias you. If you've got a method of measurement, measuring how your application, how clean, how green your application is, and that number doesn't go down if you make your application more energy efficient, you won't put investment into energy efficiency. The number doesn't go down if you make your application more hardware efficient. Well, you won't put more, any investment into hardware efficiency. That number doesn't go down if you make your application more carbon aware. Well, then you won't put any effort into carbon awareness. How you measure dictates where you put effort in, dictates where you all the investment goes. And so that's kind of um, why in the foundation, one of the things we're focusing in on is, is a method of measurement called the software carbon intensity, the SCI standard. Now, this is a standard for carbon scoring a software application. Um, it's not an accounting methodology. We're not trying to calculate a total. We're just trying to give you a score, a score for your application. And it's built from the ground up to bias action towards energy efficiency, hardware efficiency, and carbon awareness. It's built. From the, it's not an accident. It's built from the ground up to make sure that 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 if you did any of those activities, the software carbon intensity score will go down. And it scopes around what we call the sphere of influence of a, of a software team or software application. There are plenty of things that can reduce emissions, but if they're not within the sphere of influence of a software team, they're not part of the SEI standard. They'll be part of hopefully some other standard, but we're we're very focused on on software and software teams. That's our hyper focus. That would that, that, that yeah, that's what we're focused in on. Um, so there is an, an existing protocol methodology for calculating carbon emissions. It's called the GHG protocol. It's available every single organization that reports some sort of carbon emissions. Uh, reports it using the GHG protocol, the greenhouse gas protocol, but it just isn't optimized for software. It's based on this idea of organizational boundaries. Um, you know, at the end of the day, when Microsoft calculates its carbon emissions, it doesn't really want to include any of Microsoft, of Amazon's carbon emissions or Google's carbon emissions or whoever else's carbon emissions. Um, well, they do in a certain degree, but the, you, you, you need to define the organizational boundary. You don't want to, essentially you don't want to double count. You don't want to double count another organization's carbon emissions and your organization's um, carbon emissions. So you very much focus around organizational boundaries. Um, and it's what we call and the greenhouse gas protocol is what we call attributional, not consequential. It's a carbon accounting methodology. It, oftentimes, the CFOs, the chief financial officers of organizations, are the ones that are responsible for calculating the carbon emissions of their organization. It's an accounting me me mechanism. It focuses in on, on a lot of the accounting mechanisms that people use. Um, 
um, when you, however, when we talk about consequential, what we're focused in on is we don't care about what carbon reductions are, are, are. We don't care about who's responsible for a carbon molecule. All we care about are what carbon reductions are possible through our actions. That's what consequential means. So if two organizations, so if two people, if two organizations, I don't care whether my action, I work at Microsoft, I don't care if with a consequential methodology, you don't care whether that carbon molecule under the greenhouse gas protocol is accounted for by organization Z. If I have influence to make sure that that molecule doesn't get emitted, I want to do that action. So, so the SDI protocol is focused around this, this idea of consequential, not attributional uh, methodology. And also kind of the greenhouse gas protocol is, 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 is just doesn't factor in growth. Um, and, and with software products that the, the growth is, is huge. Um, so, you know, if you've got a more of a stable organization with kind of the same kind of you know, the same size every single year, um, it's a kind of a useful mechanism. But in the software space, the, the growth is is oftentimes extremely high, and, and that gives and the greenhouse gas protocol just 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 does, doesn't factor in growth. It gives you really poor feedback. Like it doesn't tell you are your strategies working. Um, and so yes, yeah, organizational boundaries. So um, uh, what I always use, like to use Windows as an example because because the Windows is used over, in over one billion uh, devices all over the world, and depending on your calculation mech methodology, I I like to use a calculation methodology which shows that um, you know the, the energy consumption of Windows is greater than the energy consumption of Microsoft. Okay, but that energy consumption of Windows is spread out across thousands, hundreds of thousands, probably organizations all over the world. Microsoft's carbon emissions from Windows is just what Microsoft employees use, um, and that's one of the challenge. That's one of the challenges with the greenhouse gas protocol. It's, it's based on its organizational boundary. Open source software doesn't even really have an organization, and even if there is an organization that's responsible for it, I like to use TensorFlow as an example. It's kind of a machine learning library. Um, it's, it's open source, and you know, Google is but Google is still it's Google it's Google open source that Google still heavily invested in TensorFlow. But TensorFlow's carbon emissions across all the organizations that use TensorFlow isn't counted in Google's carbon emissions as reported by the Greenhouse Gas Protocol. Like open source software just breaks, it doesn't have organizational boundaries, right? Um, and so what we have in the SCI protocols, we, we, call some, we define what's called a software boundary, which is like what is a boundary of a piece of software? And it doesn't, it does, it's not bounded by an organization. Um, so if you read the SCI, SCI standard, it will kind of define these topics and issues of well, what is the boundary of a piece of software? And let's count all of those emissions as emissions of a piece of software. Um, and so, and so what, you know, and essentially what you get here is kind of, there's, there's, there's going to be multiple different ways of measure, of having measures of greenness of, of, of something. Your organization can have the greenhouse gas protocol measure. Your application might have an SCI measure. That's okay. They're not competing with each other. They're two different things. They're designed around different ideas. You'll even see later on the SCI is, is very different from, it's not even a total calculation. It's something else. Um, and that's okay. I have both a height and a weight. I don't fall apart with these two, these, these, this fact. Um, we also aim to be consequential and attributional. So to think about what attributional means, let's imagine the blue square is all the carbon emissions in the world. Um, the an attributional model will then try and basically say, well, look, um, these people are responsible for these carbon emissions. This is responsible for this carbon emissions. It's trying to make sure each molecule of carbon in their atmosphere, one person or one organization is responsible for that. That's attributional. Um, Whereas a consequential model is different. A consequential model is, well, look, there's multiple people who have influence over that carbon molecule. This could be a piece of software. It could be the energy supplier. It could be a whole bunch of different people have influence over a piece of, uh, over, a, over a carbon molecule. Um, that's okay. Everybody, that's okay. You should, with a conse consequential model, you'll understand the impact that you can have in reduction, in reducing carbon emissions. It's okay if it overlaps somebody else's. That's fine. Um, consequential models don't sum up to a total, so they're not they're not designed to be an accounting mechanism. SCI is not an accounting mechanism; it's a scoring mechanism. You wouldn't use it to to give the total emissions of your organization. It's not designed for that. Um, and and also the uh, grid test model just doesn't factor in growth. Um, excuse me, one second. 
So let's imagine the carbon emissions of your application are 34 tons. Let's imagine the carbon emissions of your application are 34 tons. Um, So let's imagine the so let's imagine the carbon emissions. Sorry, I'm lost, completely lost every second. So it doesn't factor in growth. So let's imagine the carbon emissions of your application are 34 tons um, in, in first quarter, and then in the second quarter they became 82 tons. Is that good? Is that bad? Should if you're the CEO of an organization, should you fire the person in charge of sustainability, or should you give them a promotion? Um, you know, maybe your maybe you maybe your software application grew four times in one quarter. You know, then um, then actually you've done a pretty good job because you reduced your total theoretical carbon emissions because you know you grew four times. Maybe you're a small startup and you are insanely if it, if it carbon efficient, and you're taking market share from a bigger start, a bigger behemoth organization, and so. Uh, that growth is actually fantastic because you're because you're, you're making the, the you you're even reducing even more emissions going into the atmosphere because because you're taking market share market share from from an inefficient organization. Um, and that's a problem with the greenhouse gas protocol is it doesn't really factor in growth. It's all about what is the total carbon emissions of your organization. Intensities are different. Intensities are you know carbon per something so imagine if your software carbon intensity was carbon per api call then you can say in q1 my carbon per api call was 3.3 grams and in q2 went to 2.9 grams so we did a great job give me a bonus um, that's why it's called software carbon intensity it's designed to give you not a total uh, we may give you a total if, if that's provided if that was used in the calculation of your intensity but the goal is to give you an intensity is to score an application um, and this is actually the SCI. It's really simple. Um, it's just not a complex <laughs> calculation. It's the energy consumed in your application multiplied by the carbon intensity. And that gives you the, the carbon uh, emissions for your energy consumption. Then you add in kind of the carbon emissions from your embodied carbon. And you divide by something. Maybe if it was Windows, it might be users. Uh, if you've got an API application, it might be by API call, flops, installs, benchmark. We haven't, this is still being developed in the in the foundation. We haven't quite uh, settled on a, on, a, on a complete list yet. We might even also make it free form to allow people to, to have their own R's. Um, that's essentially what, we, what, the, what, the, what the purpose is, is to give you a score like this. Um, and that's it. So that, that's basically the SCI. And that's kind of how it's linked to kind of green software engineering and, 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 uh, and some of the stuff that we're doing there. So just to kind of quickly talk about the Green Software Foundation. Um, so the Green Software Foundation is uh, a new foundation. It's a non-profit. It's been launched about three months, four months ago now. Um, and our goal is to build a trusted ecosystem of people, standards, tooling, and best practices for green software. So people, we need people who know how to build greener software. We need standards like the SCI standards so people can follow. Uh, we need developer tooling because there's actually poor developer tooling out there. And we also need to know, like, now you know kind of how to, how to score an application. What are the things you need to do? What are some ideas for how to actually reduce your, your SCI score of your application? What are the best practices? That's what we're working on in the Green Software Foundation. Oh, we actually now have 15 member organizations. Oh, this is a little bit old. I apologize. We have 15 member organizations. Entity Data just joined us recently at the steering level. And I think that's it. And we have about 150 individuals taking part in kind of various working groups. Um, so it's all about creating a trusted ecosystem. Um, you know, like we, we want to make, we, we want to be, give a very clear, you know, advice to the world. Like if you want to build greener software, this, these are the standards. These are the best practices. This is what you can use. Don't just have, don't just try and go hunting around and you see like a, a GitHub repo there and there's somebody wrote a paper there. We want to just create kind of um, the definitive kind of guide, basically. Um, and we also, we are going to increase the market size. Like, we, you know, the, 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 the demand for kind of green products and services um, 
uh, 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 we're going to essentially create increase the size of that pie for everybody. Um, we're going to grow the ecosystem and just really enable collaboration. So a lot of what the foundation is is kind of really a lot of clarity regarding patent rights, IP, copyright. Um, a lot of organizations, larger organizations, struggle to work with each other because you, you just don't really know kind of what the patent kind of rules are. We just provide a really common patent rules. In fact, we, we, we mirror the same patent rules as, as W3C. So the same rules for engagement that people have on working on web standards are exactly the same rules for engagement we have when collaborating on our standards. Um, the structure is we actually have a foundation under the Linux Foundation. So the Linux Foundation owns us. Um, we have four working groups, a standards working group, which is focusing on things like the SCI, a trademark working group, which is focusing on, well, protecting our trademark. Innovation is all about open source, open data, academic research, kind of what is the, some of the, the developer tooling and things like that will, will, will fall into there. And community is all about education, uh, growing the community of green software engineer. We're growing um, uh, a global network of meetups. For people who, if you're interested in, in starting kind of a green software meetup, reach out. Um, we actually pay for your meetup group um, and we'll give you, provide you with a, um, what you need to get started, basically. Um, and a whole bunch of other kind of community-based activities, events, things like that. And we have, we have a steering committee on top and you know, they give us a lot of advice and help direct some of the, some of the strategies and budget and, and things like that. So that's, that's, uh, that's what the steering committee does. Um, more information, head to greensoftware.foundation. Um, I recommend heading to principles.green and that's where we talk a lot, still talks a lot about the, the principles of green software engineering. If you want to hang out, I'm, I'm, I'm normally on LinkedIn. You'll probably find me on Twitter, but don't bother. I, I pretty much almost completely disengaged on Twitter these days. Um, I just don't have a healthy Twitter habit, so I'm, I'm probably just going to delete my account. But, uh, but LinkedIn, I, have, I, just, I just managed to be a lot healthier on LinkedIn. So, you know, he head, head to me there. I can't, I can't promise I'll, I'll be fast at replying, but... Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of where you can find a bit more information about me. I think that's my last slide. Um, thank you very much for the time. I think now that there'll be some opportunities for uh, Q&A. I'll, I'll, I'll be available on chat for q and I believe. I think we've, um, yeah. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.